The following program contains mature content about crimes involving rape, murder, and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Previously on Southern Nightmare. Her face was purple. The window was open. And I remember the operator asking me if I could administer CPR and me telling her that there wasn't any point that she was dead. It was cold and dark that Sunday evening when Audrey Sizelove and her husband returned home to their townhouse on Thanksgiving weekend, 1987. They lived in Fairlington Villages, a community in the bustling suburbs of Arlington, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C., about 100 miles north from the state capital in Richmond. As the Sizeloves pulled into their U-shaped court of large brick townhouses, Audrey saw that her neighbor Sue Tucker's house was dark, and there was something else odd, especially given the frosty chill in the air. I noticed right away, that as soon as we got back, the, the window to her bedroom was open. I noticed that, and I thought that was strange because I had never seen that open before. Sue Tucker was a 44-year-old magazine editor for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Her husband, Reg, had worked as a photographer for the Fairfax County, Virginia school system, but a few months earlier, he had taken a job as a photography teacher at a university back in his native country of Wales. Sue was preparing to join him, getting their corner townhome ready for sale while she was winding down her projects at work. Sue and Reg were typical residents of Fairlington Villages, a friendly community largely populated by government workers. Every month or so, the women in their court would get together for a potluck dinner. Sue didn't drive, so while Reg was away, Audrey and her husband gladly volunteered to help Sue out with errands, like taking her with them to buy groceries at the local Safeway store. Early that Monday morning, November 30th, 1987, Audrey drove her husband to the airport for a business trip he was taking to Texas. When she got back home, she tried calling Sue to see if she wanted to go grocery shopping that night. No answer. Maybe Sue had already left for work. But Monday evening, Sue's house was still dark and her second floor bedroom window was still open. The next day was Monday and we normally went to the grocery store on Monday. So at some point I called her and she didn't, she didn't pick up. Uh, she, so I left a message and I never heard from her. At that point then I started really getting concerned about her well-being. And Audrey had a spare key to Sue's house, so she decided to check on her. She asked her neighbor, Kathy, to accompany her. The two women stood on the front porch of the large box-like brick duplex while Audrey unlocked the door. It opened and abruptly stopped. The chain lock was on the door. I was pretty certain she was in there, but I re- it really wasn't registering to me at the time. I remember thinking, I, I wasn't thinking, oh God, something's happened, but I was getting more concerned. And... Um, so we went around to the back, and I, I crawled up on the, on the back balcony, and the, the back door was open. And um, I pushed it open, and I might have stepped inside just one or two steps, and I thought, well, I'm not going any further because something isn't right. And I think I noticed a, an odor at that point. And what was the uh, what was the odor like? Well, rotting flesh. You know, it was it was just pretty bad. So we went back to Kathy's house and and called the police. From True South Media in Richmond, Virginia, in cooperation with Style Weekly and WRIR ninety seven point three FM Richmond Independent Radio. This is Southern Nightmare. The story of how the Southside Strangler was brought to justice. I'm your host, Richard Foster. Back in those days, Arlington only had a handful of killings each year. So you'd think a bondage, rape, and murder would be a first there. It wasn't. After 30 years, retired Arlington detective Bob Kerrig says he doesn't remember that many details of his old cases anymore. But he does recall what he told fellow homicide detective Joe Horgus that night at the Sue Tucker murder scene. It was Carolyn Ham all over again. The only thing that does stick out in my mind is the commonality of the Tucker case and the Ham case. I told Joe that night when we were at the Tucker, you know, we've seen this before. 
Arlington County Police Homicide Detective Joe Horgus was the lead detective on the Tucker case. At the time, he had been a homicide detective for nine of his 19 years on the force. Well, my name is Joseph Horgus, and uh, I was a homicide robbery detective in Arlington County. Uh, and I worked the Susan Tucker case. Back in January 1984, 32-year-old Washington, D.C. lawyer Carolyn Ham's nude body was found face down, bound and strangled to death in the garage of her Arlington home. Kerrig had worked that case. David Vasquez, a fast food worker and former school janitor with a low IQ, had confessed to the murder and was serving a 35-year prison sentence for it. So why were they now seeing an almost identical murder scene in Sue Tucker's townhome? The policeman who'd responded to Audrey Sizelove's call that Monday evening had climbed up onto the back balcony of Sue Tucker's townhouse, where they found a chair braced against the unlocked door. As they peered inside by the glow of their sweeping flashlights, they could see that a pocketbook had been emptied at the bottom of the stairs, its contents scattered haphazardly across the floor. The officers unholstered their guns and forced their way inside. Police officers, we're entering with our weapons drawn. If anyone's present, make your presence known immediately. Upstairs in the master bedroom, they found Sue Tucker's badly decomposing nude body lying lengthwise across her bed, face down, tightly trussed with glossy white nylon ropes. A pool of viscous, dark crimson liquid had collected on the comforter and the floor beneath her head. The killer had covered her buttocks with a dark blue sleeping bag. Well, I mean, the, the, the body itself wasn't pretty. I mean, uh, yeah, she'd been laying there for several days and and the skin that was, you know, had bubbles under it, if you will, from, I mean, it just, it didn't look good. She was turning black. It, it appeared as though he brought the ropes to this one. And like I said, this just gets into the escalation, if you will. Uh, but her hands were tied behind her back, and there was a rope going from her hands to her neck. Carolyn Ham was found as though she was in a position that if she if she could stay in a position long enough, she could not strangle herself, you might say. And that's similar to this one, where if you could keep your hands up long enough towards your head, you could keep the pressure from choking yourself. So I was anxious to get back to the police department to, to rip open the ham case and then to get, you know, to get in, to learn everything I could about it. One one was on one side of Walter Reed Drive and the other was on the other side of Walter Reed Drive. It was in the same general area uh, and all the MO was the same. I mean, the, the hand tied behind your back, rope around the neck, the, the purse thrown around the floor. Lab techs couldn't find any fingerprints from the killer at the Sue Tucker scene. He had broken in through a narrow window in the basement laundry room at the rear of the townhouse, which faced a small field at the edge of a wooded area on a dead-end road. Broken glass lay scattered on the orange laundry room rug near two lengths of the same white nylon rope that had been used in Sue Tucker's murder. Forensics officers found evidence that the killer had used a cloth to wipe down the washing machine below the window, probably to obscure any possible fingerprints or shoe prints. The next day, when she was out walking her dog in the field behind the townhouse, Audrey Sizelove would find a washcloth snagged on a tree branch. She carefully retrieved it and turned it over to police. There was one other detail from the Sue Tucker murder scene that Joe Horgus found particularly galling and disturbing. In the dining area downstairs, police discovered a serrated kitchen knife and a half-eaten orange sitting out on the dining room table. Sue Tucker had kept a neat house. She wouldn't have cut an orange on the table without putting it on a plate or cutting board. Clearly, the killer had taken time to fix himself a snack before leaving. We don't know, but we, we suspected it was the, the, the suspect put it there. I, I believe there was a bite taken out of it or something. And I, and I know we tried to get uh, like teeth mark comparisons and stuff like that, but it was too deteriorated. It had been sitting too long. For Helen Fahey, the Arlington County prosecutor at the time, the case hit too close to home, literally. She had lived in Fairlington Villages. I had been living there up until a few months before um, this happened. And the, the community is mainly composed of these very small World War II townhouses, a very, very pleasant community. But they were all essentially laid out. The townhouses are all laid out the same. And the one that I had 
been living in was, in effect, a mirror image of the house where uh, the victim was found. So it gave me uh, some things to think about. It was an unusual murder for Arlington. This is a very, um, generally very quiet community. There aren't a lot of homicides, and there are very few homicides like that. And someone had gotten in through a window, which means almost anyone and everyone is vulnerable. Southern Nightmare will be back after this. Southern Nightmare is an amazing podcast. It's doing true crime in a way that centers victims and their families and actively works not to glorify the murderer at the center of the story. It's cognizant of its place setting and how the setting affects what happens and how people respond. And it's a great dive into Richmond history and some of the people who make it awesome, like Dr. Marcel Fierro. Boom. That's three reasons to listen to it right now. That was Southern Nightmare fan Cassidy reading some of the tweets she's written about the podcast. We really appreciate all the great comments we're getting from listeners like Cassidy on social media and iTunes. Keep telling your followers about Southern Nightmare. I also want to thank everyone who's contributed so far to our Patreon page. I want to give a big thank y'all to Jeff Gardner, Chris O'Hearn, Julie Cook, Melanie Barker, Lillian Peters, Susan Franks, Christina Wright, Julia Brown, and Virginia Morell. We need the financial support of listeners like you to keep Southern Nightmare going for another season. And if you donate now, you can get access to exclusive content like extended interviews and our one-hour live show. Donate today at southernnightmare.com donate. The medical examiner was only able to give a rough estimate of when the murder had taken place, probably 48 to 72 hours before the body was found. But aside from the killer, one other person was certain when Sue had been murdered, her husband, Reg Tucker. It was a nightmare finding out about her. The coroner didn't put a time, but I know the time of it because we arranged to call that Friday night and I didn't get an answer. And if if, um, if she hadn't been killed, she would have answered in that Friday night. So I tried calling Friday night as arranged, no answer, called all through Saturday, called through Sunday, and I think it was Sunday night or Monday night, well, I was going frantic because I was calling every 15 minutes. And finally, uh, I got a man's voice, and it's kind of an insolent man, man's voice, and he said, what do you want? And I said, I want to talk to him. I maybe got the wrong number, and he said, and he he um, he said, no, she's not here, and I hung up. On the next call, another man answered the phone, and this time he identified himself as a policeman. I just said, uh, take a seat. I knew, I mean, I didn't, I didn't need to take a seat. I knew what it was. I just, and he said, your wife is dead. Reg and Sue Tucker had been married 18 years. She was amazing. She was very trusting and very gentle person. Uh, just amazing. She's such a gentle person, such a such a lovely soul. We met in the, in the UK when we were both at art school in uh, London, and we met there. We were together. I think we, we were together for two years before we got married. The couple spent the 1970s and early 1980s living in Arizona, where Sue worked for the U.S. Forest Service. She took her Department of Agriculture job in D.C. in the early 1980s, and they moved to Arlington. Reg and Sue traveled extensively on vacations, sometimes to visit Sue's parents and sister, who lived in Brazil, sometimes to Wales to see Reg's family. An artist at heart, Sue usually sketched during their travels. We'd be out somewhere. If we, we took a vacation somewhere, she'd sit in front and draw the scenes in front of her. She'd draw people. Sue and Reg enjoyed their life in Arlington, often socializing with Sue's cousin, who also lived in the D.C. area. But by the late 1980s, the vibe in America was changing, and the Tuckers were ready for a move back to the U.K., where they had met and fallen in love. Ironically, it was because of the violence in the States. We were worried about crime. We just thought that you know, people are much more relaxed in Wales. So it was to go back into a more relaxed society. She came and visited 
a few months before she was killed. She stayed maybe a two weeks, and then she went back to finish up some some work at, at her work, and she and to sell the house. Sue took pride in her job editing the U.S. Department of Agriculture's news and research magazine, Reg says. And at the time of her murder, she was busy putting the finishing touches on what she intended to be her final story for the publication. She was doing some research on the gypsy moth. She wrote a, she wrote a paper about the gypsy moth. And she was doing some research on sphagnum moths that linked with, with cancer. As soon as he found out about Sue's murder, Reg took the first possible flight back to D.C., accompanied by his brother. I was a mess, a complete mess. I was a mess then. I was a mess all the way through the flight. Make matters worse, they interrogated me at, um, at the airport in, in the States. Um, I suppose they thought he was suspicious that I was crying. So they took me into a room and interrogated me. A retired photography professor now living in Canada, Reg still bitterly resents the way he says he was treated by police following his wife's murder. He alleges that Horgus interrogated him multiple times, treating him like a murder suspect and doing insensitive things like dumping out the contents of Sue's purse on a table in front of him. Horgus denies this version of events and says he never suspected Reg for several reasons including the fact that Reg had been overseas when the murder occurred and that the case was so clearly connected to the Carolyn Ham murder from three years earlier. I mean, he, he was never a suspect. I, I just, that, that flabbergasts me. He was never a suspect in her death. In the immediate aftermath of Sue Tucker's murder, Horgus says, his attention was largely focused on one man, David Vasquez, the prisoner serving time for Carolyn Ham's murder. Yeah, well, in my mind, uh, first thing I got to do is, is talk to David Vasquez. Investigators had originally theorized that Vasquez had probably committed the murder with the aid of a second man. Now Horgus wanted information from Vasquez, and the detective was willing to bargain to get a maniac off the streets. He contacted one of Vasquez's attorneys and made arrangements to interview Vasquez in prison just days after Sue Tucker's body was found. He just didn't act like a like he even knew anything about the case. He just didn't come across as having done it. Uh, we, we interviewed him for, I don't know, I, I think we were in the warden's office at the penitentiary, and it seemed like we talked to him for an hour, an hour and a half, and it was like spinning your wheels and not going anywhere. He just didn't know anything. And I already had the blessing of the Commonwealth Attorney's Office to, to offer him basically his freedom if he would... <laughs> tell us who, who actually killed Carolyn Ham. <laughs> uh, but he just, he, he, he just didn't, he just didn't know anything. In the meantime, Reg Tucker may have gotten closer to the killer than the investigators. After the police finished processing the Tucker townhouse, Reg decided he would stay there a few days to be alone with his memories of Sue. That's when he received the phone call. Mr. Tucker you know, so I thought he said, Mr. Tucker, and I said, speaking. And then he said, no, Mrs. Tucker, she's not there, is she? And he kind of laughed. And he hung up. And I told August about it, and he, he just uh, brushed it off. He said, oh, and then it was, a, it was just an advertising call, just a nuisance call. He just completely brushed it off. Reg is 100% positive that it was the killer taunting him and he faults police for failing to take it seriously. Orgus, however, has no memory of the incident. It was him, I'm absolutely certain. Southern Nightmare will be back after this message. Hey, Southern Nightmare listeners. You're going to love this special offer from Audible. They're offering you a free audiobook download of your choice to keep with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. They've got over 180,000 titles to choose from, pretty much anything you can think of, from classics to the latest bestsellers. You can listen on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. I'm an Audible subscriber, and right now I'm listening to I'll Be Gone in the Dark, One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer by Michelle McNamara. It's true crime at its best. I highly recommend it. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash southernnightmare. Again, that's audibletrial, A-U-D-I-B-L-E, 
trial.com slash southern nightmare for your free audiobook. Sue's body was cremated. Reg took half of her ashes to her family in South America. He scattered the remaining ashes near where they had lived in Arizona. Oh, a place we call Sacred Mountain. And it was down near, near Sedona, between Sedona and Camp Verde. That marked the start of decades of difficult years for Reg grappling alone with his anger and grief. I used to teach, I used to teach in the university, and I used to teach like three, two, uh, two to four days a week. I used to be like, uh, you know, the, the happy guy in, in, in work, and I'd come home and cry all night. And this went on for years and years. Reg also dealt with the murder in his art. In 1996, he published a book of his photos called Seeing the Hours which featured portraits he took around the world of people frozen in place, waiting for something that would never happen. Uh, the, the theme of it was waiting, and uh, it's, a, it's a book of photographs, and the photographs were of people who were waiting and who'd gone into themselves, and, and a lot of people said that, that it was a very... Uh, <laughs> some people said it was a depressing book. There's no smiling faces in there. These days, Reg is coping with the recent loss of another woman he loved, who had helped him finally find some peace. I was really angry until maybe five years ago, I'd say it's a good 25 years. I met another woman in 2009, and we worked together, and she, she helped me get through it. So she helped me get through. Well, we talked about it quite a bit, and... Uh, she helped me uh, laugh again. Uh, I feel like I've come to terms with it. I can't undo it. I just feel that she has found peace. In a way, I've kind of accepted it. And at that time when I met her, I was making, I was making images that, that were very angry and about violence to women. And... Through Gail's help, I was, I, you know, I, I learned to laugh again. And uh, this time, well, actually in January 2016, she was diagnosed with a, a very aggressive form of lymphoma. She did chemo and she, she died last August. Gail's death is yet another trauma for him, Reg says. But not too long ago, he had a dream in which he felt enveloped in a perfect sense of peace, love, calm, and security. He thinks it was a message from Gail, still looking after him. He hasn't felt the same sort of presence from Sue, but he believes there's a reason for that. I don't know if I believe in Nirvana, but Sue was such an incredible person. And after the the murder, I did get some help from... from, uh, psychologist or a, I think it was psychologist or psychiatrist some one of those and he said to me well you know do you believe in angels and, and at the time I didn't know or anything but one thing he put to me is that you know maybe Sue in paying this price was paying was paying her last debt and that's what I think I think that she's totally free now that, that her spirit has, has moved on to another stage. Next time on Southern Nightmare. We're approaching Christmas, and uh, we're approaching the meeting with the FBI because that's the most significant part of this investigation. And why is that? Because they're the ones that told me how to find who the suspect is. Southern Nightmare is a production of True South Media in cooperation with Style Weekly Magazine and WRIR 97.3 FM Richmond Independent Radio. New episodes are released every Tuesday. It's recorded at Sound of Music Recording Studios in Richmond, Virginia. Our producer is John Morand. Original music by Daniel Davis. For exclusive extra web content, visit our website at southernnightmare.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to leave a positive review on iTunes. It helps people find us. 
We'd like to give special thanks to everyone who gave their time to talk with us for this podcast and to you for listening. Pleasant dreams.